are all here. Um, my name is Deb Evans, and I'm one of the lead coaches here at Tailored, and joining me today in presenting is Marianne Ashley. She's one of our other coaches. She lives in Nevada currently. She's um, actually a missionary in Ireland, but she's here on home assignment in Nevada. And behind the scenes up in Michigan, we have Lindsay Riggs, who's our operations wow. manager, and she's going to be running our chat and also managing the the Q&A box. And then Kavina Wilson is in Thailand. Thanks for staying up late with us. And she is running our slide. So we're excited to be with you. And we are looking forward to the next um, hour where we're going to talk about this awesome and wonderful concept of creating and implementing a year-end strategy. We're going to take it from concept to reality. So we're going to look at why it's important to do a year-end appeal. We're going to talk about how to identify an area of impact how to set a financial goal, and then how to create a layered strategy, and finally creating that plan and that timeline, because that's absolutely critical. So throughout the webinar, we want to hear from you guys. So in your Zoom window, you're going to see a chat button, and this is what you're doing right now. This is where you're putting comments, what kind of apple you like, but other comments that you want to share, or if you have some suggestions and stuff um, of things that have worked for you, we'd love for you to put them in there. And we're going to put comments and links to some different websites in there as well. And then the other button that we want to draw your attention to is that Q&A button. So if you've got a question at any point in the webinar, put your question in the question and answer box, the Q&A box, because if you put it in the chat, as you can see with everybody chatting in there, it can easily get lost and we might miss it. So we, um, this is live. We want to learn from each other. So if you've got a helpful suggestion, please go ahead and share it. And we want you to ask as many questions as you want to, too. We're going to pause at different points throughout the time to take questions. And if we don't get them all through the webinar, we'll stay on at the end and answer them all. Um, and sometimes we'll answer them live. Sometimes we might answer them through the texting uh, feature that's in that Q&A box. We also are going to give a few poll questions throughout the webinar because we want to get your feedback around your fundraising experience and also your goals. All right, so why do a year-end appeal? Well, the fourth quarter is a huge time for people to give. So here's some quick stats. Did you know that nearly one-third, 31% of all giving occurs in December, and particularly 12% of that giving happens in the last three days of the year? And some people plan to give a portion of a bonus. A lot of people get bonuses at the end of the year. They plan to give them some for tax purposes and some for charitable reasons. It really is the season for giving. And I'm just going to be straight up honest here. I was, a, I was a Giving Tuesday skeptic for a long time. And it's really shocked me over the last three years. So in 2019, um, the U.S. totals for online and offline giving were $1.9 billion. So in one day, $1.9 billion was raised in 2019. And then during the pandemic, you guys, it went up to $2.5 billion. And then last year, it went up again to $2.7 billion. So last year was the 10th anniversary of Giving Tuesday, and it went up another 9%, even again during the midst of the pandemic, which to me is absolutely amazing. So as I was preparing for this webinar, I was wondering, okay, so what's being forecast for this year, um, this year in giving, because we're in a recession, right? So what did I do? I Googled it like I do everything. And I came across um, a really, really encouraging article that I'm going to highly recommend you read. Lindsay is going to put it in an email uh, in the in an in email to you guys at the end of the webinar, she's going to send a summary email with all the links and stuff. But I wanted to just highlight what they wrote. So it's a Forbes article, and they wrote the world seems to be in a constant state of unprecedented, and the philanthropic sector is no different. Their research showed notable growth, and that Americans are giving now. Hello, ring light. Um, more than ever before. And last year, uh, Fidelity Charitable Donors recommended $10.3 billion in grants to their favorite charities. That's that's just one, that's just Fidelity, $10.3 billion in grants to their favorite charities, which is 13% more than in 2020. And get this, 41% more than before the pandemic. So charitable giving has remained heightened since 2022, Donors are watching this humanitarian crisis unfolding in Ukraine, and they're rushing 
to send support. So in response to such unprecedented events, more and more people are looking for ways to aid those in need and ways to reach them as quickly as possible. And there's individuals who actually have donor advised funds and they've turned that to their accounts as ready reserves to offer this kind of support. So this continued attention to charitable giving supports a historical pattern that guess what, during challenging times, Americans respond with philanthropy. So if you don't get anything else out of this whole webinar, this is the nugget right here, ask because not asking is still the number one reason that people don't give. So ask. And current volunteers and, and um, current givers are the most likely to respond because they're already involved. So in fact, um, volunteers are twice as likely to give than non-volunteers. So don't assume that just because a volunteer is already giving of their time, that you can't invite them into this year in giving because guess what? They believe in the mission. So give them other ways to be involved. It's also an opportunity for people who are on your general mailing list or your email list to give. So with that, let's jump into our first poll question. Have you ever sent a year-end appeal for your ministry? Simple yes or no will suffice. Marianne, what do you think the percentage is going to be? Uh, how many people do you think on this call have sent a year-end appeal? Um, I'm thinking, I'm going to guess 60% have done it. Okay. I think I'm going to go a little bit higher. I'm going to go, I'm just, I should go 61%, right? Because that would just be you. So <laughs> like I guess, just, right. yeah, exactly. Right. And do I want to showcase? <laughs> Probably not. There's no showcase for me, but so I think it's going to be a little bit higher. So we'll see. Oh my gosh. 60%. 60%. This is rigged. It's rigged. Wow. <laughs> Congratulations. You won. Awesome. <laughs> That's awesome though. So now we're gonna talk about identifying impact. Um, and when starting a plan for your year end appeal, there are four components. So the first component is to identify the impact of your year end appeal. So contrary to what one might think, the primary goal of your year end appeal is not to raise funds, but rather the primary goal is to accomplish something with your partners that will impact someone's life. So that's a huge mindset shift there. That is so important. It's not about the number per se, it's about what we can do together in this ministry. So you need to be appealing for something specific that you can accomplish. Um, how will raising these funds affect someone's life other than yours? And often what you find yourself, um, when you find yourself in a different financial situation, you usually ask the question, how much do I need? How much money do I need? But really the question should be how much money is needed to impact someone's life? And ideally this is something that you've already committed to do. So when identifying the impact of the appeal, you wanna ask yourself two questions. So the first question you wanna ask yourself, what program, event, or resource do you provide or are planning to provide that could use additional funding? So I'm gonna give you some examples. Um, one example would be uh, an English, a weekly English club for refugees centered around the Bible. Another example might be providing food, clothing, and shelter for someone who has experienced a natural disaster, which we're experiencing more and more and more around, around the world right now. Um, that could be offering basic medical care, renting an office um, for an evangelistic event or counseling. Another one would be holding a training and providing resources for church leaders overseas somewhere. You've uh, come up with a program or resources. So now ask yourself the second question, what difference will this make in someone's life? We talked about the English club, uh, refugees feeling empowered and not alone, coming to Christ through Bible study and interaction with other believers. That's an impact that that would have. Um, Another one would be disaster relief. So if you're, if you're setting up some kind of a disaster relief, then families can stay in their community. They can feel loved and cared for and experience Christ through his church. That's an impact that that would have. Another would be training church leaders. So local churches are growing and leadership often needs help becoming more effective for the transformation of their congregations and communities. Um, and if you're having a hard time thinking of a specific impact, try this exercise. 
Assume you're successful in all of your fundraising. And by December 31st, you raise everything that you need. So now tell people how that made a difference and what you did with it. So start there and let that generate the impact you focus on in your appeal. So think if I have every, all the money that I need, if I don't need to raise any more money, what would I be telling people about the results of that? And that will give you an idea of an impact. So on that note, you might be tempted to focus your year end campaign on getting out of a deficit. Many ministries are running in deficit at the end of the year and it hurts and it happens a lot. It does need a solution, but even if your year end campaign will help you get out of the deficit, getting out of the deficit cannot be the impact for the appeal. So you, you get that? That can't be the impact. You need to go further and ask, okay, how would this ministry being adequately funded make an impact in someone's life? So that's what you want to focus on. Then use that impact for the year-end appeal. Again, it is what we can accomplish together. So true. So it's really, really important to identify that impact. And that is the, that's the first component to this plan. The second component that you want to do is to establish a financial goal. And it needs to be directly related to what impact you set up. So your goal needs to include the total cost of the impact. So don't just think about the direct costs of a program or initiative. Make sure that you're doing the work and including the overhead costs of maybe there's transportation needed or food needed or stationary or stamps or even time compensation. When setting a financial goal, you need to land on something that's achievable. Be intentional and think about your donor base and their capacity. Why is it important to consider capacity? Because it varies from partner to partner. And you don't want to set a goal that exceeds what your list can give unless you have a specific plan to reach new people outside of your current list. So if there's anything that I took away from that Forbes article that I read, Again, don't let this economic information that we're hearing about in the news deter us from asking. We've seen God move people to give astoundingly generously <laughs> through all of these things that are happening in the world. Remember that God's economy runs different than the world's. Uh, you may also want to um, consider generosity. If you have people that are generous, you may want to challenge them to do something generous, but again, make sure that it's achievable. One of the biggest benefits of a year-end appeal is, like Marianne said, accomplishing something together. So you're creating a moment where everybody's coming together and everybody's achieving something together. So it's an opportunity even for people who give regularly throughout the year to give above and beyond, because guess what? A lot of them do. So don't ever exclude anyone from a year-end appeal because they've already given in that year. This appeal goes to everyone. Yes. And the third component to this is to create a layered strategy. So you have to have a strategy. You can't just um, do this off the cuff. So one touch um, is not enough. 59% of nonprofits make between one and three donor touches for their year end campaign. And I want to talk about what three touch strategy could be. So the first would be warm up. You want to thank them and remind them of what the ministry does and what we've accomplished together so far. So the history of, of what you guys have done together. Then there needs to be a strong ask. It needs to be very specific about the goal and the impact with a solid ask amount. In our experience, we have found that having a specific ask amount is effective and it makes it easier for people to see exactly how they can help and what the ministry needs. The third would be a reminder. So you wanna briefly highlight some of the language from the ask, the goal and the impact, which will remind them to give now. So I wanna dig into the strong ask a little bit more. If you want to get even more specific in this ask, we highly recommend segmenting your list and you want to segment based on capacity. There are typically three groups to segment people into. So the first one is going to be your highest capacity donors or major donors. These are the people that you need to write a personalized letter to and make up a 
make a follow-up phone call. And for the average person, anyone who can give a gift of $500 or more at one time could be considered a major donor. And you might have a higher capacity network in your community. And so you might wanna set that mark at $1,000 instead of 500. It depends on your, your community and your network. Often people think of major donors as only giving once a year, but it could be people who have already given and people who are giving monthly even. You might be thinking, well, they already gave, so they're not gonna give again. But the opposite is actually true. People who have already given are more likely to give again because they wanna see the ministry continue and succeed. They believe in it and it speaks to them. So it's up to you who you think a major donor is gonna be in your network. Um, but it's important to identify who these people could be and to approach them personally in some way. This is not like sending them an email or a letter, like you want to call them. So if you wanna see even more success, you can do a one-on-one -on -one ask with major donors whether that be in person or over the phone or video chat, if you're far away, um, it is a personal touch and it's worth the investment of time. And they will appreciate that as well. So we've also found that a matching gift works really well for year end appeal. So consider asking one or more of your major donors if they would be willing to provide a matching gift. You never know unless you ask. Um, it can be motivating for people to know that their $100 that they donate can turn into $200 because of the matching gift. Another level to add can be mid-level donors. So again, what that means exactly is going to be different for everybody. But usually that's somewhere between $100 and $500 gift. Um, but the more specific you get, the better. So a lot of people are more comfortable giving ranges as an option. But in our experience, you're much better off asking for a gift of let's say $250, then you are asking people to pick their own price, pick their own amount between, like if you, you were to say, oh, give a range of, oh, you can give 100, between 100 and $500. We have found that if you just not give that range and actually ask for $250, that is much more helpful. People know exactly what you want. So you need to pick the amount. And the final level is everyone else on your contact list. So everybody else, whether they've given in the past or not. So this group does not need a personalized letter. Though, I mean, you, if you have a system that does that automatically, go for it. But you do still want to have a specific ask with this group as well. We also recommend setting the financial goal after you have segmented your list and contacted your major and or mid-level donors, especially if you are doing a matching campaign so that you have a better idea of what is possible from the rest of your list. So you really wanna make that list, segment it, and then think about a, a better idea of what you might have. So let's talk about non-cash assets for a minute, okay? So non-cash, many people don't think about donating stocks at the end of the year. Um, capital gains taxes can be completely avoided. Also, after you turn 70 years old, the government requires a mandatory distribution of your IRA. So this was all foreign to me when I saw this for the first time, um, but the older folks know exactly what this is. Um, they can be, this can be donated to avoid taxes. So remind your retired donors of this. You wanna check with your ministry to see if they have a way to accept stocks as a gift. And most likely they do, most, most organizations do. So it's foreign to us maybe, but it's not foreign to your organization. Um, and you would need some following information for your ministry to send to the donor if they wanna make a donation of stock. I'm not gonna give you this list, it's a big long list. So for time's sake, I'm not gonna go through that list, but we're gonna send it to you, this list of what they might need to donate stock. We're gonna send that list to you in an email after the webinar. Um, you also wanna consider sending an additional email after the first one with the subject line, I forgot to mention. So after your initial email that you're gonna send out to everybody, you might wanna follow it up with another email that says, I forgot to mention dot, dot, dot in the subject line. That way it kind of piques someone's interest. So I'm gonna give you an example of what that might look like. Um, so the subject line, I forgot to mention dot, dot, dot. And then in the body of the email, as an example, you might say, that you can avoid capital gains taxes by donating stocks directly to the ministry. It's a very smart way to invest in spreading the gospel. 
If that is something you are interested in, please let me know and I will send you more specific information on how to do that. Also, if you do decide to give through stocks, if you don't mind, let me know so that we can make sure it gets allocated correctly. So that's just an example of, of a way you can say that and way you can ask for that gently. Um, and then another way is after that initial email that you send out um, or direct mail, you wanna put a handwritten PS on the letter that you're sending. That's another way you could do that. Those are really good tips, Marian. Um, and your organization can help you work through all of that if you have questions. Um, another part of creating a layered strategy is to think through what channels you're going to use to communicate your year-end appeal. But before we do, I want to throw in another poll question. What communication channel are you most likely to use in your year-end campaign? So you can pick more than one, but we really want you to kind of pick like the, the one or two that you're most likely to use in this year-end campaign. Uh, again, Marianne, what do you think it's going to be? I think email and social media is going to be the biggest. That's what I think. Okay. What do you think? I think email for sure, but I would say followed by direct mail because I think people are going kind of back to the old school uh, with the direct mail. So I don't know. We'll see what they have to say. Email. Yep. 77% direct mail, 40%. Phone calls, 20%. Social media, only 20%. That surprises me. And then face-to-face mm -hmm. -face asks are 3%. This does not surprise me. <laughs> <laughs> that does not surprise me either. Phone calls kind of surprises me, actually, that 20% are making phone calls. That's pretty great. I wonder um, if phone calls and text message is like in that same, if they if they would text people. So, yeah, that's a good point. We probably should add that to next year's uh to next year's put, put text as an option. Um, that's good. Okay, um, so good job, you guys. You're on it. All right, let's look at four options for communicating, starting with direct mail. All right, so believe it or not, direct mail or physical mail is the most popular mode of communication for year-end appeals. Think about your mailbox. Probably starting mid-October through the end of the year, you're getting hard copy campaign, hard copy envelopes from lots of different charities. So direct mail, physical mail, still really, really popular. And anytime when you're doing this approach, anytime that you can make a personal touch, take the time to do it. You might write a personal note at the bottom of some of your mid-level donor letters or consider handwriting the addresses and choosing a colored envelope that makes it stand out. Um, I actually have some clients who have little ones and they put their little hands in paint and stuck them on there and had them draw little things and people opened those because they saw the, the little handprints from the kids. So any um, chance that you can make it unique, any chance that you can make it more personal, the greater chance that it is going to be opened. So if you really want to make a big difference, you could also try a service that would handwrite a letter or a postcard for you like handwrite. This is pretty bizarre. They have like this robot arm and they put the pen in the robot arm and the robot actually writes the letter for you. So this is a great option for people who are overseas. Uh, Lindsay's adding that to the chat. It's also going to be in that summary email. It does have a cost to it, but it's a small investment compared to the return that you could get. Uh, you could also use a postcard um, and you could use something like executive stationery because executive stationery stands out to major donors. All right, let's talk about email. So there's a lot of different email services out there. Probably one of the most famous ones that everybody uses is MailChimp, but there's another one called Polymail. And again, Lindsay's going to add this to the chat. Um, those are a couple of our favorites for this type of thing. Um, they allow you to set up a series of emails that will automatically send at a time that you set up. And we highly recommend looking into options for this because it can really free you up from having to do it manually every time. So instead you just get it all lined up and then you enjoy your holidays. You just go make your turkey because they'll go for you, which is great. 
Um, another big plus in using these services is you can set it up to where the program will personalize the letter for you um, and it will do it automatically from your contact list. And it gives that personal touch without you having to do all of the extra legwork. So we'd suggest using just plain text so that it doesn't look like a mass email. And just a tip um, from Kavina from last year that I remember, um, people were asking about uh, how do we make it less likely for this to go to spam if you use just one, maybe two links, but no more than that, it's less likely to go to spam. All right, phone calls is um, the next method that people use. Uh, Follow-up uh, phone calls can be very effective at getting people to respond to your year-end appeal. And we found apps like Slidial uh, that allow your call to go straight to voicemail, save a lot of time. And also if you're particularly anxious about using the phone, if it goes straight to voicemail, this might be a good option for you if you don't do, do well with phone calls. Um, if you're gonna make a lot of phone calls, please, please, please write out a script so that you're not like just rambling or saying random weird things. Um, but something like, hey, Sarah, I hope you got my latest email. We are looking to raise $10,000 to provide scholarships and school supplies to children in need. If you would like to make a difference in a child's life, click the link in the email to give. And again, thank you so much for your consideration. You could also just text the same thing with the link too. All right, let's talk about social media. We recommend using social media as a supplement to your other strategies. So for example, if you're using direct mail or email, we want you to use, we're encouraging you to use social media as a supplement to those strategies, not as your sole channel of fundraising. And if you want to check out our social media uh, webinar that we have, it's on YouTube. You can check that out. Um, even organizations that use social media effectively to raise funds typically do so because of the investment that they've made in establishing the relationship outside of social media. If you're going to use social media for fundraising, it's best when you have a very specific and highly urgent need. Again, like Marianne said, that's not a deficit. Um, a highly urgent need that can be communicated through a brief story. Stories are everything on social media. So a family who's lost their home, a village that ran out of medical supplies, an orphanage that's running out of food. If you use this mode, we highly encourage you to also add, vi add visuals, especially video, to communicate the urgency. Um, it said that a picture says a thousand words. Well, videos can say a million. And add the link to the actual giving page. This is something that really bothers me. People just add a link to their organization's website and then people have to click through, click, 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 click. Don't do that. Actually get the URL that is your giving page and embed that. You want to give them as few links as possible. So get them straight to exactly where they need to go. And just as a rule of thumb, Ian, if you're asking digitally, like if you're asking through email or social media, you want to give a digital way to respond or a link. If you're asking in a physical mailing piece, give a physical way to respond. You can add the other options as well, but make sure that you at least have the option that matches the channel that you asked through. So don't mail someone a letter and then ask them to type the link into their computer. Give them a pledge card and an envelope to return their gift in, as well as instructions on how to do it online. And if you provide a pre-stamped return envelope, studies show that you have up to a 31% higher chance of a donor returning with a gift. So you could even include a QR code on that, um, that uh, what am I trying to say? The giving card that you that you send with them, you could put a QR code on there if you want to have that for people who like to give mobily. That could be an option as well. Um, and I know that this sounds crazy, but if you do a branded donation form, it helps raise up to seven times more. And I think it's because it looks a little bit more legit and people feel more comfortable sharing information that they know is going to go to the right place. So make sure your hard copy and your online forms look their best to be able to boost engagement. Okay, so Lindsay, do we have any 
um, questions in our Q&A box. We do, thanks. The first one is from Patrick. He says, one of the challenges of doing phone calls to specific people is that they live overseas. So making those contacts is more challenging. Um, so do we have any suggestions on how we might make a personal connection from overseas for major and mid-level donors? Yeah, you could probably, oh, go ahead, Marianne. Well, I was just gonna say, um, FaceTime and WhatsApp, I mean, we, we've got like all of these different avenues where it could be free. Um, so I'm just not sure, it, is it is the question maybe um, difficult for a phone call because you're overseas and it's it's harder to get a hold of somebody or because it's more expensive? Um, yeah, but what were you gonna say, Deb? Because I was just thinking, you know, it, it's FaceTime, we've got, we've got so many different avenues to, to call somebody. What were you and you've say? got Skype, you've got Skype and you've got Zoom. Skype, I know, has a paid calling plan. There's another one I know that some friends of mine use in Mexico called Line 2. I know it costs money, but again, when you're thinking about raising thousands of dollars, an investment even for a month or two months of Line 2 is going to not be an issue once you're raising this kind of money. So there's plenty of options from overseas to make it personal. So we said FaceTime, we said WhatsApp, we said Zoom, we said Skype, we said Line 2. I don't know if anybody else has, has other things that they want to suggest in the chat box. You're certainly welcome to do that. Thanks. Uh, I have another question here from Bethany. She says, is there any data on the effectiveness of text message versus voicemails and how to decide between them? I have an idea, but I'm gonna let you guys answer it. <laughs> I don't know if there's any data. Do you know either? No, yeah. so I was gonna what say, do, Lindsay, what, what you got? Yeah, <laughs> yeah what what you got? I don't have any data to reference, but I would say know your, know your partner, know your donor. Right. So yeah. they like to communicate with you on the phone or it, I mean, I have people in my life like you can only text them. There is no other way to communicate other than face to face when I see them. Right. So know your people and and do what fits them. Right. Not just what's convenient for you. Yeah. Good advice. That is good advice. And I know um, when we were doing some research for the millennials versus Gen Z, getting them involved in your team. Um, that Gen Z really does not like the phone. In fact, it makes them very anxious. So probably your younger people may actually prefer texts over voicemail. Yeah, there was also a question someone put in the chat and it gets lost easily, but Todd asked if year in giving was largely a US thing um, because of the tax benefits mm -hmm. or if this is also true for other donations in other nations. Uh, we had someone share, which I love learning from everyone else, that in Canada, they get similar tax benefits. So um, it's pretty common there. Um, so I don't know, Marian, what's your experience in Ireland? Kavina, if you have any experience in Thailand, what's your in giving like globally? Yeah, that is, that's a good question. That's a great question. Ireland does it completely differently. Um, they do have a, it's not a year end thing. They have it all year round where the government matches um, charitable giving uh, for tax purposes. So, gosh, that it would be it, you'd have to just you'd have to like research what that is in every country in each in, in your country of service. Figure out what they do and what that's like, and then implement it. I would assume. Anything else to add to that? Um, Penny in Spain is saying that. It doesn't really work in Spain, but in Canada, she says it does pretty well. Um, and then Todd was mentioning in the chat that uh, if you set up a Google voice number with a US number, it's free for texting, calling and receiving calls. So that's good to know. And Google Meet is also free. Thank you, Laura, for that. Um, Victoria was asking, what would you recommend for cold calls? I don't know about you, Marianne, but I wouldn't really recommend cold calls. I'd always recommend a warm up. So a text, some kind of message to warm up or, you know, your newsletter could also be a warm up, um, something that's 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 going to give them kind of a heads up of what maybe impact the ministry is having or a personal check in something like that before you make a cold call. Yeah, I agree. Okay, do we have any more questions, Lindsay? I don't see any more questions right now, but we can uh, take some time for more questions at the end. Okay, sounds good. All right. 
So talking about the components, the fourth component is to establish a timeline. So when it comes to creating a timeline for preparing and sending the year-end appeal, it's best to work backwards. So you wanna start with when, when you want people to receive your year-end appeal. So when do you want them to get it? Um, you might consider hitting people's inboxes or mailboxes on the Tuesday after Thanksgiving, which is known as Giving Tuesday, as Deb was talking about. Um, remember the stat that we gave at the beginning? This day has risen 143% in popularity for giving in less than a decade. So if you are going to send an email, what day or time do you want to send it so that people have it when they wake up Tuesday morning? And if you're doing a direct mailer, what day do you need to put it in the mailbox in order for it to, to arrive on or before that Tuesday? And how much time do you want to give yourself to segment your list? Um, how much time do you want to give yourself to write the letter and to have it proofread and gather contact info, address envelopes, all of these things that you need to do to make this year end appeal. How much time do you need for that? Um, and it's a good time to do this by hand. So if you're going to like write, um, like send out direct mail or send out cards, which I've done in the past, write it by hand. It takes a long time, but it's worth it there's a really good chance that you're gonna begin this whole process at least four weeks before the day you want people to receive it so that your year-end appeal doesn't get lost in the very large pile of other year-end appeals or Christmas cards. I mean, everyone's being, everyone gets more mail this time of year. Um, another date to be mindful of is when you want people to respond. So when do you want people to respond to this? This is gonna create urgency and urgency is huge. So the most common date is December 31st because it's the end of the fiscal year and that's when most people give. But you might have a deadline that's sooner than that and that's okay. So the important thing is that it needs to be communicated. So if, you're, if your deadline is November 30, 30th or December 20th, whatever, you need to clearly communicate that so people know when they need to give. Another important date that we recommend scheduling now is when you are going to send thank you notes or make phone calls to tell people how their giving is making or will make a difference. Um, even if your impact is something that may not happen until next spring, you need to follow up right away saying, because of your gift, here is the impact that will happen. So send that thank you note, even if you're, the impact hasn't happened yet. As soon as you get a gift, send a thank you note. And a fun little saying that we have over here um, to help you remember this is, Thank before you bank. So send that thank you before you actually deposit it into the bank. Thank you before you bank. You wanna say thank you as soon as possible. So whatever date you choose, make sure it's sooner rather than later. And if new donors receive a thank you phone call from within you, uh, from you within 48 hours of you them giving the gift, their second gift is likely to be 50% more than the first gift. So the stats on that are really cool. Um, thanking somebody within two days, they're going to give again, and that gift is going to be bigger than the first. So quick gratitude is super important. And when you identify impact, you need to set a financial goal. You need to create a layered strategy and establish a timeline. You'll be well on your way to having a good plan for a successful year-end appeal. So consider these results from missionaries like yourselves. I'm going to read a couple of testimonials now. Um, this is a testimonial from Scott Moffitt. Last year, your insights helped us more than double our usual year end results. That's amazing. Um, another testimonial from Thomas Frake. Two years in a row, employing the advice that we received from Taylor specifically related to the ask, the impact and the three steps, as well as using the last three days of the year, we were helped to raise $25,000 through year end campaigns. So if you wanna maximize your year end strategy this year, it's important that you connect with a tailored coach soon. Um, for first time clients, we would coach you for the next three months. We would coach you through how to lead a ministry of generosity, creating a powerful message that people want to respond to and developing a detailed plan to reach your funding goal by the end of the year. Now, if you're a past client, we would coach you for four sessions over two months. 
and we would work together to focus your messaging for your year end impact and then put together a specific strategy and plan, then start implementing that, that plan. And you would have email access to your coach through the end of the year if you need to troubleshoot or need feedback. Um, one more testimonial here. Uh, this is from Brian from Campus Outreach. Through his work with Tailored Coach, Brian from Campus Outreach surpassed his $30,000 goal by almost $21,000. And by the end of January of 2022, he had received $50,951. That is amazing. So if you're interested in working with one of our Taylor coaches, set up a quick call with Benny to answer any questions you might have. And he's gonna help you with the next potential steps. So um, Lindsay's gonna put that link in the chat um, and it just go ahead and click that link and that will set you up with one of our coaches, Benny, and he's going to help you figure out your next steps of what you need to do. Okay, I noticed that we have a question in the Q&A box, but I want to, before I answer it, I want to spend a little bit of time in reflection. So um, we have experienced a lot. We've covered a ton of details. Mary and I, I feel like we've been around the world again. I think we've given you a ton of information. So we want to know from you guys, what's something in this webinar that's been helpful for you? So use the chat box to put your answers in that, and um, we'll reflect on on that and then we'll get to Bethany's question. Thank before you bank. Yep, I love that saying. I know that was cool. Practical ways to segment your donor list. It's so important. Don't be afraid to ask. People are generous and willing to give. Yep. If you don't ask, then they will, will not give. Amen. Um, by asking about impact rather than how much, um, it gives me something to think about. That's great, Penny. Really dig into what is the impact? What is your vision? What do you want to see happen in 2023? Uh, match the match. way. Yep. Yeah, that's good. Matching the way that, that. You, yeah, that you, whatever you're doing, matching, matching that. That's good. Yep. How to utilize stocks and people's giving. That was a new one for me. Mm -hmm. It's a very creative way. We've had people give stock to our kids who are doing short-term mission trips. We have a family that donates uh -huh. stock every year to short-term. They give like $400 through stock. So I knew it was an option. I just, I don't know how to do it, but yeah. um, working backwards is huge. I'm telling you what, like you don't realize how long it's going to take. And one thing we didn't mention in here that the English major in me goes, ding, 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 proof your letters for the love, please proof your letters. And if you don't have the English ability to be able to proof your letters, have someone else do it for you, or there's always Grammarly. There are plenty of um, services out there that can help you with that, but please don't send things that are unproofed. Um, Todd says, make it not about deficits, but to accomplish something. Yes, absolutely. Like your language is so important, right? So like, even if you do have a deficit and it would be really helpful for your ministry to be fully funded, make it about the impact that that would have, not about the fact that you need more money. Mm -hmm. I really love, um, that Stanley and his wife are going to use this as a prayer year end appeal. <laughs> I think that's awesome. That's so great. Thomas, I'm glad that that was encouraging for you too. I mean, I really was kind of like, what is going to happen this year? What's going to happen? But, you know, we see it time and time and time again, that Americans respond generously and willingly. People want to help. They really do. And um, letting them know of the needs, making people aware and asking, it's effective. And stories are impactful too. Yes, absolutely. Okay, let's take some time for some question and answer. Thank you, you guys. Those are really encouraging uh, responses. Um, okay, so what do you think about sending a year end uh, update slash Christmas letter slash thank you? How to time this if you're also doing a year end appeal? Uh, Marianne, I know you guys do send, don't you send Christmas cards 
every year? I actually, yes, but also we have done Thanksgiving cards. So I know it's super close together, um, but an interesting and, and kind of a cool thing to do is a Thanksgiving card because nobody sends those. And so yours is gonna be most likely the only one in the box. Um, so that's an idea to get it done beforehand. But yeah, Christmas cards we have sent um, and it took me, I don't know, at least a week of just sitting down and giving myself a few hours in front of the TV or something and just writing those out, writing those out, writing those out. And it does take time, but it's really worth it. And people love getting a Christmas card from another country too, if you're based overseas. And you've got teenagers. You can employ people who can actually write letters. <laughs> they can, you know, their family. Go if ahead. They have, if they have handwriting skills. <laughs> if not, then do not do that. <laughs> I do not, I do not recommend Good that point. if they don't. Good point. You know, another thing too is um we didn't, I don't remember us saying this. Maybe we did, maybe we didn't. I can't. I can't remember, but when, after the year end appeal is over, making sure that you follow up with a thank you and letting people know what the results were, especially if you were doing a campaign that had a specific target goal with it, just letting people know what God actually raised can be super encouraging. And you could do a happy new year card if you wanted to. Mm -hmm. um, someone here is well, writing that they actually do Easter cards. So yeah. it doesn't have to be a Christmas card. And also I want to say too, Amazon is great for every kind of card that you might think of. So um, you, you won't be able to find Easter big stacks of Easter cards in the store probably, but go on Amazon. Um, I found some really great greeting cards that had a really pretty scripture on the, on the front. And one of the scriptures, it was like four different scriptures, but one of them was, um, I thank God upon um, every remembrance of you. And it was really great. So I'm thinking those people are going to put that up on their refrigerator because it was pretty and it was a scripture. And I love the Easter card idea. You can do Valentine's cards. I mean, seriously, any, anything you could, you could pick your holiday and send it then. The green yeah. card company will love you. <laughs> well, I have a couple, I have a follow-up question to that because I'm not sure about it. If you're sending a Christmas card, Thanksgiving card, Easter card, whatever it is, do you include an appeal with the card or how, how do you do those things together? Don't you want to focus it if you're doing one thing at a time? Help so me I think, think we're talking about this. thank yous, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think that that personal touch point, I think it's just important to have a personal touch point at least once a year. And you can do that through a card. So it's a separate thing from your year end appeal, but it could be like we were talking about a warm up. Your card could be a warm up to your appeal. Yeah. Great. Thank you. That's what I was thinking. Mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or suggestions? No, but I'm expecting um, everyone to get more cards in the mail throughout the year this year after this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> and my recommendation would be to do it early too, because over here, the United States Post Office is struggling. I mean, the labor force here is is struggling. So I know our postal, we've already, we've only been in this house for like a couple of months and we've already had two different post people. So um you know, with this time of year being crazy and the supply chain and the whole work labor force doing it earlier rather than later would be my encouragement. Thomas okay. has a question about maybe sending gifts, um, like a book for a major donor or um, something like that. Would you think it's better at Thanksgiving or around Christmas? I think it can be really any time of the year. We yeah. just got a gift from, I got a gift from one of the people that I coached and it was a devotional book and it came probably a month ago. And that was what, what's now, it came in the summertime. So I don't think it necessarily matters. I want to be we on send, Philip's team. Yeah. He sends chocolate yeah. chip cookies. Send me a giving link, Philip. <laughs> The donator. I love that. That is so great. That is mm -hmm. awesome. I've also seen teacher gifts um, with a like a coffee gift card that says like, thanks a latte. It's kind of cheesy, but you know, it does the same kind of thing. And 
those you don't have to spend a lot of money on those either but like that and robin and yoko are doing the same thing that um you suggested about just being from a different country you know something specifically japanese and again good any time of the year um had oh, a good. couple Look of at new that. questions come in um is there any fear of donors feeling like you're spending their money to send thank you cards instead of investing in the ministry. Have you guys ever seen anything like that? No, I haven't personally ever. No, and thank you cards. I mean, it's not like how much is a thank you card versus if they're giving, even if they're giving $25 a month. I mean, it's not a big, huge investment. And if they have a problem with that, I don't know. Um, I just, I, I've, I've never heard of that. Yeah, I wouldn't feel like you have to give a gift. I think that could be more of just a maybe when you're on home assignment, you know, mm -hmm. or um, to like a major donor type thing. Um, oh, okay. You're saying, yeah, no, you're saying not necessarily thank you, Chris, but gifts. Yeah, I think sometimes just little gifts and things. Like I know people have brought like magnets or they've brought like chocolate or they've brought paprika from Hungary or, you know, something small, not something humongous, but something small. I think, I think it makes a difference. Sure. And Thomas asked, how much time would you allow between a warm-up touch and a direct ask? Not much because people are forgetful. Right. And it depends again how you do it too. You know, if it's email, they'll forget, text, they'll forget. I mean, I, I would say not much time. Um Okay, we've got some suggestions about um, it's a lot to try to do a gift, a letter, and a year end appeal all year end. Yes, it is. You were right about that. So space them out. There's no reason why. And you know what? They're not going to be expecting it in the middle of the year, right? It's going to get kind of lost in the shuffle of everything that they get at Christmas. So make it special. Send it some other time of year. I think it'll be more, it'll stand out a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Okay, well, if you found today's webinar helpful, uh, we are uh, offering a $25 gift card to anyone who would take a 30 second selfie video to share what you found most helpful. We need one that's taken both vertically and horizontally. So just some suggestions for ways that you could start your video. You could say, hey, I just finished the tailored webinar on year end giving. And what was most helpful for me was, and then fill in the blank, or you can say, I just finished the tailored webinar on year end giving and their webinars are so helpful because of whatever you learned or just say something great. Uh, we will be sending everybody a follow-up email and in that email, there's gonna be a Google Drive folder with these suggestions and instructions for you on how to upload that video. And if you upload a video, just a, remember 30 second video, horizontal and portrait, um, we will send you that gift card if you do it by 5 p.m. Central Daylight Time tomorrow. So that's basically like a day and a half. Um, you don't have much time. So by 5 p.m. Central Daylight Time tomorrow, we will send you that $25 gift card if you upload that video. All righty, it has been so great to be with you guys today. Thank you so much for interacting with us in the chat. We love that so much. Um, we hope that you're walking away with some really valuable tips on creating a strategy for year-end appeals. And if you want some real-time updates and free resources and more, follow us on social media. And we also want to let you know that we have a brand new webinar coming out in November. We're going to talk about how to fundraise in a virtual world. It's going to be on Thursday, November 17th at 9 a.m. And it is going to be Central Standard Time. So the United States is going to observe Daylight Savings Time. So we're going to move from Central Daylight Time to Central Standard Time. So November 17th, 9 a.m. Join us for that. Um, thank you guys so much for joining us. Have an awesome day and we hope to see you next time. Bye.